Good morning. Merry Christmas. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to greet you in the name of Christ today and welcome you to our worship on this first Sunday of the Christmas season. You know, the Christmas season actually begins on Christmas. Uh, it's weird because the world teaches us that the Christmas season begins in September or whenever you start putting out this stuff, right? But in the church, the Christmas season actually begins on Christmas and it ends on Epiphany, which we will celebrate next Sunday. And so I welcome you on this first Sunday of Christmas. Also, as we anticipate a uh, Happy New Year this coming Wednesday night into Thursday, I'm so glad that you're here in God's house to celebrate God's love for you today. How many of you are wearing something today, anything today that you got for Christmas? Jewelry, clothing? All right, awesome, huh? Do you feel good? You look good. You look, you look marvelous, as they used to say. I'm, I've actually had this for a while, but I'm wearing this Christmas stole for the first time. And it, it has a beautiful story on it. It tells the whole story, but the, the stars foreshadow the crosses here, which is a reminder that in giving Jesus God, has really uh, made a sacrifice. God has really held nothing back in terms of his great love for us. And so it's with that great love in mind that we gather together as his children to celebrate Jesus from start to finish. And of course, the end of the story is even more glorious than the beginning. And we're here throughout the year to celebrate all of it. And so I'm glad that you're here. I would invite you to take a moment to fill out the tear-off section of the bulletin this morning to let us know that you've been here, especially if you're visiting with us. We want to extend um, a welcome to you, and thank you so much for blessing us with your visit. Please let us know if there's anything we can join you in prayer for or rejoice with you about. We would be honored um, to do so. I'll just also point you to all the various announcements, including a very important congregational meeting, an opportunity for an important update next Sunday, immediately following worship, not during worship, but immediately following worship next Sunday, an update from the vision team. Will you please stand with me? We're going to spend a few moments now in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, examining all the ways that that first chapter of the Gospel of Luke looks forward to Jesus, because today the theme of our service really with Mary is that we are looking forward to what God is going to be doing. So this was Luke chapter 1's anticipation of Jesus. You'll join me. Your parts are bolded and in yellow. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, Your son Jesus will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the Then Mary visited her cousin. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and in a loud voice exclaimed to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, was filled with the Holy Spirit also and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He And then he spoke to his own newborn son, the one we call John the Baptist. And Zechariah said, And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, I wish the rising sun
You may be seated except for our younger children coming out for our children's moment. stable cat in the store in the stable where Jesus was born. He's kind of a tough old cat because like all barn cats, nobody fed him, nobody petted him. He just caught what he had to eat. But they say he was fat. Anyway, the story was happened a couple of nights after Jesus was born. He was laying in the manger just crying and crying and crying and nobody could make him happy. So finally the cow, the goose and the sheep from the stable wandered up looked in, the cow says, oh, I know what's wrong with him. He's hungry, but I have some milk. I'd love to give him my milk, but nobody's here to help me. I guess I can't give him any milk. It's too bad. Then the goose looked in and says, no, I don't think the cow's totally right. I think the bottom of that state, uh, that manger is hard. He needs a pillow. I have all these wonderful feathers. I could make him a wonderful pillow. Is somebody just come and help me do it? But there's nobody here. I can't help him either. This is kind of sad, but it's the way it is. Then the sheep looked in and says, Now, they may be right, but I think the real trouble is he's cold. He needs a blanket. I have all this wool. If somebody just share my wool and weave it into a blanket, but there's nobody here to do any of that. So I guess we'll just have to leave. Too bad we can't help him. And as they walked out for away from the uh, away from the manger, they came to the door. Uh, sorry, as he started to walk away, the stable cat wandered up. The sheep looked down at the cat, and the goose looked down at the cat. And the goose spoke to the old cat and says, "What are you here for? You have nothing to give the baby. You have no you have no milk for sure. You have no feathers for sure. And I don't think you're." fur is going to do much for him. Well, the cat looked back up at him and he just silently jumped into the manger. And within a minute, the baby was sound asleep. And so the cat stayed with the Christ child for a couple of hours. Finally decided it was time for him to go because he was getting kind of hungry and he had to go catch him some supper. So he quietly jumped out of the cradle, out of the manger, went over and started out the door of the stable and pretty soon at the door, he ran into the cow, the goose, and the sheep. This time they, the goose looked down at him, and the sheep looked down at him, and the sheep says, how did you do that? You have nothing to give the baby. You have no milk, no feathers, and there's not enough of your filthy fur to make a rag, let alone a blanket. The cow looked up and says, I gave him what he wanted most. Oh, who the cow? What would that be? Like I said, repeated the cat, I gave him what he wanted most. I just went to him and loved him. Will you all pray with me before you head back for Children's Church this morning? Let us pray. Dearest Jesus, we love you. And sometimes we're not sure what we have to offer you that may be anything that could be of help to you. But Lord, you will take whatever it is that we will give to you and you will love it because we're giving you our love. We cannot thank you enough for coming in the form of a baby king uh, to be our savior. And so, Lord, we just love you and we want to offer our best gifts to you first. So help us to know that when we, when we don't know what to offer, if we will offer you ourselves and our love, that that's the best gift we could offer to you. And we offer you our love in Jesus' name. Amen.
breath. <laughs> I remember growing up in an older house in Minneapolis, in Moorhead, Minnesota. My mother was a stay-at-home mom who tried to keep everything in good order. And she had a wonderful garden. She had peas and corn and potatoes and beets. Mom and I used to sit on the back porch and shell peas and cook beans. And I stood up on my little stool and tried to do everything I could to peel the potatoes and put them into the boiling pot. Mom made rolls that smelled so good. <laughs> One evening, Dad came home and looked pretty discouraged. I knew better than to ask what was wrong. Mom and Dad went into the bedroom and I heard them talking. And finally, Mom came out looking as though she had been crying. She told me that Dad had gotten a pay cut and that we had to go on and we had to be very, very careful with, with, with what we had. And we worked to pray that everything would be okay. Mom made my clothes and we went to the library for books and we had vegetables from the garden, which was nearly all of what we had to eat. I, I sat on the porch and thought about all the people who had so much less than what we had. Clothes and shoes that were from Goodwill and, and, and they had mats to lie on and to cover up with and Red Cross food. Some nights we had hamburger and, and peaches and that was essentially what we had to eat. I decided that somehow, somehow, if, if only I would not eat so much, maybe somehow we would have enough to eat for the next day. Bedtime came <clears throat> and I went up to my room and undressed and said my prayers and went to bed. I started to cry. I cried until I fell asleep. About two in the morning, I woke up rather suddenly and, and, and squinted a bit and saw a, a white figure standing at the end of my bed. I didn't know who it was, but, but I did know that it had a calm and quiet voice. And it said to me, Oh, Terry, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. Don't be afraid of what you'll eat or drink or wear. God knows that you need all these things. He loves you. The figure disappeared. And I went to sleep. And I went to sleep peaceful and happy. I woke up the next morning and never heard the voice again. I do remember one thing. One thing that the voice had told me. Be still and know that I am God. Wow. The words of Micah that Jessica read for us on Christmas Eve come back to my heart. He himself is our peace, right? He himself is our peace. And those very same words, of course, that 
the Lord had his messenger speak to Terry's heart or words that he shares with us today. Don't be anxious about tomorrow, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear. God knows you need all of these things. I bet Mary had some very, very similar feelings to those feelings that Terry and her household were going through at the time. And just praise God for your testimony. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we love you and give you thanks, Lord. You have been so generous to us. Lord, we know that the scripture tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. God, we know that's you. The gift of Jesus came down from you. The gift of peace that passes understanding comes from you. The gift of being able to know that we don't have to be anxious about anything, but Lord, that in everything, by, with thanksgiving and prayer, we can present our requests to you. And Lord, the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. And so, Lord, before you now, we are silent. We are still. And we pray, God, that if there be any doubt in us, that you would help us to know in this moment that you are God, that you can be trusted, that it is a right and good thing for us to put our confidence in you because you do not let us down. So, God, thank you. Thank you for that. And Lord, we pray that you bless these gifts that we give. May they be a reflection of our love for you. And may you help us in our giving to be like you. And in all things, Lord, to be more and more and more like you. For it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen.
Would you remain standing for our gospel lesson, which comes from Luke chapter 2, if you would respond in a bold type. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. And the firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A hair of dust for two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for what him, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that was spoken against, so that the cause of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had an asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wonderful 
in awful words more clearly through time. I could always see him. I could actually always see him running through fields and hugging my neck, learning to speak, and flying kites. But he would say, I love you in so many ways. And he would teach me. Friends, they 
It is so much easier to look forward than to see forward. We're looking forward to seeing our grandchildren. We're leaving after church today and we're making the drive over to Moorhead. We're really looking forward to Christmas. We've had several Christmases with different parts of the family at different times. And I think this is the one we're most looking forward to. And then we get to go to see my mom and dad. And Really, really looking forward to being with my brothers and sisters and mom and dad. Looking forward, you know. I haven't grown a beard in several years, and I'm looking forward to seeing just how white it is now. You know, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward. Seeing forward is really quite a different matter. And today, we wanted to think just a little bit together as we conclude this series on Mary's labor of love about what it means with God's help to really see forward. There's a family circus comic that shows Dolly reading to Jeffy and PJ. And she looks down at the book and she says, Mary and Joseph were camping out under a star in the east. It was a silent night in Bethlehem until the angels began to sing. Then Santa brought baby Jesus and his sleigh and laid him in a manger. She glanced over at Jeffy, and she saw he wasn't paying attention, and so she raised her voice. She yelled, pay attention, Jeffy, or you'll never learn the story of Christmas. Chestnuts were roasting by an open fire, and not a creature was stirring, so the Grinch stole some swaddling clothes from Scrooge, who was one of the three wise men riding on a tiny reindeer. Well, so Dolly is teaching Jeffy and PJ the important story. She's very uh, aware of the fact that it's important that they understand the story. But this story happens every year in the middle of so many other stories. It's easy for us to get confused about what's most central, what's most important. What are the lessons that God most wants us to know because we have encountered Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the angels and the shepherds and all of the faithful others whom God visited with his favor and his grace during this holy season. On the Road, Pray, and Study Guide printed in the middle of your bulletin today, there's a review of where we've been these past several weeks. I'm not going to go over all of that with you. I do want to just step back and revisit number five if you're looking at that. You'll, you may want to uh, remember where we were just a few days ago on Christmas Eve. Many of you were here. Some of you were not able to be with us on Christmas Eve. But there's another comic panel called Ziggy. Some of you know Ziggy. The perpetually challenged character is shown in one episode putting up Christmas lights while imparting this advice. At this special time of the year, it's important that we all take time to rejoice. Especially since many of us haven't even joyced yet. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, we talked about Mary counting her treasures. And that counting of her treasures helped her to be internally, externally, and eternally grateful. We are people who can change on a dime if our perspective can go to from negativity to 
optimism or from thinking about what we don't have to thinking about what we do have. Thinking about our blessings, counting our treasures. And today, we've arrived at our final subject in the series, which is Mary Sees Forward. Now, we are a people who sometimes have a difficult time seeing forward. And here's just a little bit of proof. 93% of Americans exchange presents. But when it comes to Christmas shopping, number one, 40% of the toys given in December are broken by March. Number two, 50% of Americans spend more than they can afford. I wonder if that statistic might be a little off on the side that makes us feel a little better. Number three, one third of the population will take six months to pay off what they bought. And in addition, 20% will struggle to make the rent or mortgage payment in January because of Christmas spending. See, that's indicative of a problem with seeing forward. It's one thing not to be worried about what we'll eat and what we'll drink and what we wear because God will take care of us. It's another thing to throw caution to the wind and not be concerned at all about how the choices that we make in our day influence the way that we will be able to face our future. But most of us from time to time wish we could live with little regard for how the choices we make today affect our future. But today, we're going to observe Mary doing what all of us need to do. She faces the future. The Luke chapter 1 passages that we shared at the very beginning of worship today shared something in common. They were all positive. They were all about the glorious, wonderful way that God would unveil salvation and bring hope and peace to God's people. Even what Simeon says to Mary and Joseph in chapter 2 of Luke echo the same. He says, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a life for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people, Israel. Wow. See, it's all good news up until about halfway through Luke chapter 2. And we know that in Luke chapter 1 and in that first part of chapter 2, Mary's thoughts and feelings are summarized by the idea that she pondered all of these wonderful things that have been said about her child and she treasured these things in her heart. But certainly these words that Simeon went on to share with her were not words that stirred the same kind of hope, that brought the same kind of Peace that anticipated in the same way, the same kind of joy. Now, mind you, Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, is right there, but the Bible makes it very, very clear that Simeon is directing these next words just to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he says, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. It's not sounding so positive, is it? So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You see, in order to really see forward, Mary had to hear the reality of who and what her son was to become. Mary was raised in the faith, and she knew what Jesus would come to know about God's prophets. We all know what's true about God's prophets, right? God's own people never did a very good job of receiving God's messengers. As John put it in chapter 1 of his gospel, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now Jesus, in preparing himself and his friends for his coming death, reminded them that Jerusalem is the city that kills the prophets. And he was chief among them, the prophets. And Mary had to get a dose of reality. It's not a contrast. It's not opposed to the things that were said in Luke chapter 1 and the first part of Luke chapter 2. It was an additional understanding that needed to be brought to bear upon Mary's understanding of what would happen as the days unfolded in her child's life. And so here are some of the things that we see that Mary knows she's going to have to anticipate. There's going to be heartache. But on the other side of that heartache, because of God's promise, there is hope. There will always be hope. 
on this side of that hope that it will be pain. Mary is going to have to experience pain. How many of us have not felt a sword pierce our soul? Maybe not most of us to the extent that Mary did, but all of us know that internal, emotional, spiritual pain of hurt and heartache, a sword pierces our soul. But on the other side of that pain that we all will feel sometime, there is peace. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be a lot of it. But on the other side of all that trouble, there will be triumph. The greatest victory that could ever be anticipated. Even better than a UK win over Louisville. Hard for some of you to believe, but true. A triumph of the greatest, greatest magnitude. And so Mary faces reality. But she knows that on the other side of this harsh reality, there is redemption. And there is restoration. And these things make all of the trouble and all of the heartache and all of the pain worth it. Because we have to go through that to get to the next place. And so here we are about to begin the month of January. And some of you know about the Roman god, Janus. Not J-A-N-I-C-E, but J-A-N-U-S. And Janus is the appropriate personification of the start of a new year. This particular Roman god has two faces. Janus not only looks ahead toward the future, but looks back at the past at exactly the same time. And so as we pass from this old year into a new year, we try to be a little bit like Janus. We've learned from what we've encountered and experienced in the past. And that, in a sense, with God's help, prepares us for what we're going to face in the future. Some people make ambitious resolutions. Other people just take a deep breath and hope for the best. But I want to suggest this morning that I don't believe Mary was the kind of person who takes a deep breath and hopes for the best. She has a confidence that's much greater than that. I believe she had assurance. I believe she had an assurance that God desires all of us to have. An assurance that all of those left column miseries, heartache and pain, and trouble and harsh reality, with God's help, they are all defeated by all of those right column majesties, hope and peace and triumph and redemption and restoration. May it be so for you and for me as we close out this year and begin a new year together. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for faithful Mary. And Lord, how you chose her to be a representative of what the rest of us might be with great faith and hope in you. Lord, help us to be like her. And Father, we pray today that as we leave this place, you would help us to leave with the same assurance that she had. That on the other side of Simeon's prophecy, there is promise and peace and hope and triumph. God. Bless us with that knowledge and assurance today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Dear friends, I wanted to take just a moment to uh, extend a thank you to everybody who's helped to make the season so beautiful, including Molly, who has been married for us uh, week after week and portrayed probably from about the same age that the, the mother of our Lord really was, uh, the heart of a child who was holding the very hope of the entire world in her arms. And so I want to thank Molly and thank the choir, Carol and Kenneth and Debbie and Marita and everybody who shared special things during this season. It's been a wonderful season and a great time of celebration. And I'm very thankful um, to God for all of you. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks. And as we prepare to leave the doors of your house now, we know that we go out into a world that is your world. And so we are your people. Help us to be your people in this world. And help us to be like Mary in the way that we approach our life and our faith so that we might see forward with confidence these things we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Mm -hmm.